Today is the second in a three-episode look at the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater with my guest, Samantha Figgins, a dancer in the company who shares her inspiring story. I'm your host, Patrick Oliver-Jones, and this is Why I'll Never Make It. Instead of knowing that a lot of my issues, like um, insecurities, anxiety, dancer problems, instead of knowing that it is a result of my hearing, I put it on myself. Welcome to the podcast, where I sit down with creative artists each week and talk about the realities of a career in the performing arts, all the while challenging the notion of what it means to make it in this business. To listen to last week's focus on Alvin Ailey, as well as more episodes, you can go to the website at winmepodcast.com. Today's guest, Samantha Figgins, is a true inspiration. She's in her sixth season with the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater and has three other sisters, all of them dancers as well. But as a baby, Samantha lost all hearing in her right ear and to this day still continues to struggle with single-sided deafness. But she never let that hold her back from pursuing her dance dreams. For four years, she danced and toured with Complexion's Contemporary Ballet, which is based in New Rochelle, New York, and co-founded by Dwight Roden and Desmond Richardson. She's been featured in dance articles and on the cover of Dance Spirit magazine, and I've even seen her over the years as I go to the annual concerts presented by the Alvin Ailey Dance Company. The work and artistry that they put into presenting both new works as well as the classic works by Alvin Ailey himself, it's simply amazing and often breathtaking. I first saw the company back in Chicago years and years ago, and they ended with Revelations, which has stuck with me to this day and has been a favorite of mine every year I see their concerts. No matter how many times I see it, it, it's as if there's a connection, there's still a connection to the story, the emotions, the raw energy that exudes from the dancers on that stage. Awesome. Well, it's amazing that you... um we're able to connect so much with the company, especially with your acting and singing background. I mean, I think that's what makes Ailey so important and just like, uh, this really stands out is the theater aspect that we have to have as dancers. Um, we can't just be on stage doing dance steps. It's definitely the acting, how you portray a character and things that really have the audience gravitate to you. It makes it relatable, you know? There's so many different characters on stage. <laughs> For sure. And and I mean, the, the music of Revelations is certainly moving in of itself, but I think the, mm-hmm. the dancing and that storytelling is really what drew me in. And I think that's something right. that, that Alvin Ailey really... Uh, just as as a whole, it seems like they focus on that. It's not just about we have amazing dancers that can do all these wonderful things with their body. They actually tell a story while doing it. Right, exactly. And I think that was what is most important to Mr. Ailey is telling the human experience. And a plie or tendu, arabesque. Yes, it's pretty and you can watch it all day. You know, you have uh, Ailey dancers are just so physically beautiful. It's those things can get lost. The whole purpose of the dance can get lost if you don't have the storytelling aspect of it. Right. So right. yeah, not only, I mean, definitely for auditions, are we looking for strong dancers, but can you tell a story? Can you be relatable? Especially with, with some of the, you really have to be vulnerable yourself. You have to like be willing to, to let your emotions out. It's not just about making sure your mm-hmm. arms are in the right positions, make sure your heart's there as well. Right, right, right. You have to um, definitely, I mean, I think I can work on my technique all day long. It gets exhausting. But after that, um, you have your technique for a reason. It's supporting you so that you can throw it away, so that you can bring whatever you've done in your life to this movement. And not only for yourself to sort out some emotions inside, you know, this may feel good to me. I'm in a rage. I'm like celebratory. I can put that in my dancing, but it's good to just let other people know that it's okay to share their stories, Mm. you know, and let other people know it's okay to be vulnerable and to, you know, just be open, I I think, to all your feelings and to everything that you are as a person. You know, I can't be happy all the time. I have to 
experience the full range of my emotions. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Now, now, before Alvin Ailey, you were with Complexion's Contemporary Ballet Company. Mm -hmm. What was that transition like for you going from one professional company to another? And in so doing, what, what drew you to Alvin Ailey specifically? Um, what drew me to Alvin Ailey was the storytelling. And not just the storytelling, but what is um, how they take their pieces, their dances, and make it relate to what's going on in the world around us. So I feel like I'm dancing for a purpose. Um, but getting into Ailey um, was really exciting. I never actually thought I would go this route. I really wanted to be a contemporary ballet dancer. Um, and so it was nice to be in Complexions because the founders of Complexions, White Roden and Desmond Richardson, are both Ailey babies, you know, they both went up through the Ailey program, the Ailey school and things like that. So it was mm -hmm. kind of like I was getting an Ailey training. Um, <laughs> you know, they like groomed me and it was just an exciting time to dance with them. Um, but the transition to Ailey from Complexions was definitely, uh, it was startling in some ways and then comforting in others. Complexions was, you know, a, di a very diverse group and Again, it was another family. So that family element was there for me at Ailey as well. And then just going home to a predominantly Black organization was very nice to be a part of. It really did feel like I was going home. You know, ballet, you have this aesthetic that was created for Europeans and French and Russian people. And so trying to put that on as myself, um, I was just, you know, trying to form into something that was not really meant for my body. So which is fine. I did it anyway. And I excelled. <laughs> <laughs> and I excelled. So it was just nice to go back to Ailey and, you know, recognize the black body that I have and that being, um, you know, really appreciated and celebrated there. Uh, but for me, I think it was an opportunity for me to start fresh and start over. I had to really uh, be okay with starting from the bottom and being, you know, freshman in the company mm -hmm humbling myself and allowing myself to be a sponge uh, to the senior members in the company. There's so much history and legacy to learn and me not going through the organization at all, like not going through the Ailey school or Ailey who or, you know, those things. I, I kind of had a little bit of doubt in my head, um, just feeling like everybody has so much more Ailey training. They like, grew up trained to be this alien woman and I was like how do I put that on um so I did a lot of back and forth in my mind trying in my first year just trying to honestly put on different versions of what an alien woman is hmm. for me and you know that was very difficult <laughs> it was just like just be used to me. <laughs> That's all, you know, you're here for a reason. Because of the, the Ailey legacy, you felt like there was an expectation of what yeah. Samantha needed to be. Yeah. So what, yeah, exactly. Or what Samantha needed to be. Yeah, definitely in Ailey. And I just needed to be myself and trying to be all these other different women, trying to be channel a Juana Smallwood or trying to channel a Linda or a Sarita Allen. I can, you know, channel that, but it's, that's not, it's literally not me. So I had, I had to really just figure out what, what my judge, what my magic in the company was. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, there was like two years of me just uh, in the wind. Mm -hmm. Within the many styles of Ailey, is there one that speaks to you the most? Is there one that this is how my body moves best? An mm -hmm. Ailey? I felt my body moved best doing contemporary ballet, honestly. That's just me. And so. <laughs> which, which is a foundation of a lot of Ailey dances. Right. He was a ballet head, you know, doing The River and How to Do. Like, I love those ballets where you get the jazz and, and the musicality and things, but you still get to do your ballet line and you get to do the technique. So I love, I love all like the river night creature is like so good. Jazz is fun. Um, and then I also really love when um, Wayne McGregor came for Ailey. That was everything that I needed. <laughs> <laughs> now, now what about him specifically? Well, he has his own random dance company in um, London and, He's just a choreographer I've been looking at since I was in college, wanting to work with him. 
and it's contemporary ballet. You know, he usually choreographs on point um, for the Lily Ballet. Here we are at Ailey, so. Um, <laughs> but that's how you know, like, I mean, the Ailey dancer is versatile. We can do, we can do it all. And I know Wayne likes to come work with the company because not only can we do ballet, but we have the groundedness of all the African dance and the, the um, what is it, uh, social dances that we do. We have all of that flair and like zhuzh in there that he's like, you know, excited to use us because we use our whole body. And, you know, that's what contemporary ballet is. It's head to, do head to toe. How do you move in extremes and still make your line and make all these awkward abstract shapes? So working with Wayne was an amazing experience. Doing all of Mr. Ailey's really classical works are amazing. Um, so yeah, that's. I think that's where I feel. Like. You know, having someone like having someone like you as a guest on the it makes me wish I, this was a video podcast because I love the way you're moving and expressing everything. I mean, I, th I think that's the dancer in you coming out. It really is, and you know, that's probably the reason why I started dancing. It's just like when I communicate, it's just all of this right. <laughs> movement, and um, you know, body language is the first language that we learn right. as you know, humans as babies so and i did think it was video recorded so i like <laughs> put my makeup on did my hair put a little outfit on for you no please i just got out of the shower i did my hair you know i wanted to look presentable yes, as well so yeah. yeah exactly okay well gotta show up anyway no matter what you gotta show up prepared exactly, so, exactly. and that's what i did at Ailey. i showed up prepared that's all i really i mean the transition i'm glad i like was able to transition and be prepared through Dwight Road. And I just had to believe in myself my first year. And I was like, ah. And so what is that day-to-day -day training like being a member of the Ailey company? Day-to-day, -day, we have um, our company class in the morning. And then we just have uh, rehearsals straight through the day, like with five minute breaks here and there. And then um, a big lunch hour break where you can have physical therapy if you need to eat your lunch if you need to, and then we go back into another three hours of rehearsal. But, you know, every dancer is individual and everybody needs something different. So they give us company class, but we are blessed to be inside this big glass building full of dance classes. So we can go take um, one of the, uh, the student classes in the extension program with ballet or take a Pilates class or yoga throughout the day. So I personally, I wake up, have my breakfast in the morning. If I am on time, I can do a little, <laughs> <laughs> I can do a little Pilates workout in my apartment or go to the building where we have a nice physical therapy room with gym equipment and, you know, treadmill, elliptical weights and such. So a lot of people spend their morning before class in that, that physical therapy room doing whatever they need, cardio get your body worked up yeah. um, and get ready for class. Now within Ailey, how often do injuries happen? Obviously everyone looks like they're very fit and everyone takes care of their bodies, <laughs> but how often do injuries happen? So like injuries for us, honestly, we dance so much and the rep is such a wide variety of um, styles and techniques. So, and we're just changing them all day. This change from rehearsal, rehearsal, going from ballet to hip hop. And so injuries are very common, honestly. And it's not like, I don't think a lot of our dancers injure themselves doing a big jump carelessly and falling. I think it's just a repetition of us dancing so much, um, doing revelations every single day, laterals. After three weeks, my rib is out of place. Mm. And it's not anything that I did wrong it's just the constant repetition of the movement and then the constant changing of um styles that can shock your body which is why we are always <laughs> in the physical therapy room either getting physical therapy or doing preventative um injury type of exercises just to make sure our knees and our muscles are tracking the right way and just doing extra things outside of the studio that stabilize us and strengthen us so that we can go in the studio and kind of let it go. Yeah. So yeah, injuries are common. Now you had mentioned Revelations, obviously that's the seminal work of Alvin Ailey mm -hmm. and that generally ends most every, especially on tour, it ends every concert. And what does that piece doing and being a part of that piece, what does it mean to you? Hmm. Revelations is a homecoming for me, I think it's a opportunity 
to honor my ancestors. Um, and it's a place where I, where I can be vulnerable. I don't even really think Revelations is me acting. <laughs> you know, I think that's just me being honest in a place of honesty and safety for me to be honest and for me to show what it is to go through your struggles and your pains and to have a moment of baptize um, and just come out of that and end in a celebration. I think um, Revelations means to me legacy. You know, I have, like I said, my ancestors, every time I get to do wade in the water, I pretend like I'm going to church with my aunt Geneva <laughs> and I pray, thank you every time. And um, I try to dance for them. So yeah, I think it's definitely a place where I can honor the people that I love and the story of our community and give that back. I think it's also an opportunity for exchange with the audience. Um, I think it gives them a chance to have their own celebration in their seats, you know, like see mm -hmm. us on stage. How does that, how do you, how do, where do you find that in your own life? And how can you celebrate yourself? You know, so. Yeah. yeah, it's very important. So the directors and choreographers assume that the longer someone is with the company, they will be a lead. There's, there's, is there that sense of, of you know, hierarchy in Alvin Ailey? I think there's definitely more so seniority. Ailey is, once you get in, it's a company full of stars, you know, so it's your first year, but you're still a baby star, <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> So um, they, everybody, everybody, the company, the directors, they know, they have an idea of where they see you. And you have a, an idea of where you see yourself and you do the work to get yourself there, you know, because um, we can do Beauty and Yellow all day, but <laughs> it is our goal <laughs> to graduate into, you know, these other roles and the, the heavier roles. Yeah. You, you're supposed to be here and we want to see you in the front. You know, everybody, everybody needs a chance to be seen because everybody in the audience needs a chance to be seen, you know, yeah. so. What is it like performing for audiences? Because especially whether it's Revelations or these new works, there just seems to be an emotional, visceral reaction to what's going on on stage. Yeah, seeing the audience react to us is really funny sometimes <laughs> because we have... Uh, story ballets so hearing their reactions to how different characters are playing on stage and how we interact on stage and it's like they're watching tv sometimes i like really love to go into the house and listen to what people say like in between a um in between shows and in between the um, intermissions and things but always for me i i take an extra second at the end of revelations where we um have our final pose and the crowd goes wild and mm -hmm. it's just clapping and screaming. And I just sit there, honestly, and I like absorb it, <laughs> like power up. Um, but it's just, it's crazy how much they really do love Ailey and they're like lifelong fans, honestly. When we go to Atlanta, we see people who have been coming to the shows for like 40 years, honestly, grew up in the theater. Um, Atlanta is especially funny because on Sundays, they have church service <laughs> in the lobby. <laughs> and so, and sometimes they miss the first two acts just to, you know, finish their service because they are here for revelation. <laughs> they don't need to see all those new dances, that new hip hop. They don't need to see it. They're just here for revelation. So mm -hmm. our fans are so um, die hard. And it, again, it's a family, honestly, it's a family. Our performances, they, it's a healing experience, not only for us, but for them. So there's times where, you know, people in the audience, they're going through a lot of things. They're, they're, they are going through things and seeing our performances, it just, sometimes it makes them cry or like just have this emotional reaction. And it's medicine, I think. And we help them. We help, we help people. We really do. It's like, we're not first responders, but like in the dance, <laughs> in the dance world, it's in, in the spirit world, we are like first responders, I think, you know, for the spirit, for your heart, you can come to Ailey and 
get your soul stirred in a way that you feel triumphant and you can go back into your life with the feeling of you can do anything. Yeah, well, as as one of those audience goers, I, I can tell you there there's something not only choreographically, obviously it's beautiful, but combined with the music, and then as you say, each of you dancers putting your heart into it, then I'm relating to you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just seeing this this classic dance piece. I'm seeing a person on stage echoing something I've been through and then, you know, and then we're sharing that experience together. And I think that's something I had to really learn at Ailey because I love technique, child. But we have to be pedestrian. Dance has to look like a human being at the end of the day. You know, I'm a human being telling a human story. You know, Ailey is just all about, yeah, human experience. So it's important to just be vulnerable and let yourself go, let yourself free. Mm -hmm. So that everyone in the audience has something to grab onto, something they can hold on to and just see themselves on stage. This is from this wonderful piece Mr. Ailey created in 1960 called Revelations. Mr. Ailey was 29 years old when he choreographed this masterpiece. It's been danced all over the world and understood universally because he understood the humanity in us all. Revelations is a reflection of a journey we all take in life and hopefully triumphantly. That was the magic of Alvin Ailey. He was able to see you in the audience, see me as the dancer and see the connection between us and choreograph works that connect us all. So you felt he was telling your story while I felt I was dancing mine. That was Judith Jameson, Alvin Ailey's protege and artistic director emeritus of the dance company, echoing the sentiments of Samantha about this beautiful, soulful choreographic masterpiece. But when Samantha first joined the company, she wasn't able to hear this stirring music clearly. That's because when she was only 10 months old, Samantha had spinal meningitis, which put her in the hospital for 10 weeks and caused her to lose all hearing in her right ear. Ever since, she's lived with single-sided deafness, which in time turned into auditory processing disorder, which is when the brain has difficulty processing speech. So verbally, she found it difficult to communicate and engage with others as much as she wanted to. But physically, she found solace and freedom in dancing. And as she grew up, Samantha was able to watch and follow in the footsteps of her older sisters and twin sister. I think I knew I was going to be a dancer and I'm just very thankful that I was able to watch my older sister who um, was a dancer. She was a soloist at Dance Theater Harlem and then went on to uh, dance uh, on Broadway. And I think it's just really important for any young child, if you are in the um, field of the arts or whatever your professional field is, to have a mentor to see that where you are right now is a possibility. It can actually happen. You can actually take this somewhere. So I think I definitely knew I was <laughs> going to like, make this work because I really wanted it to work. I saw my sister do it. I got this advice in college that, you know, you put all your energy into your plan A. And if that's your plan A, you have to make it work. Yeah. And I'm, I was just naturally just a hard worker. And I just wanted it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, yeah, I mean, I knew I was going to be something. <laughs> Because dancing is in your family, as you mentioned, your older sister was a dancer, and then you also mm -hmm. have a twin sister. And so yeah. was were your parents into that? Like, how did the whole family seem to get into the arts like that? Uh, my mother, she's a seamstress, um, and my father works in medicine, so I don't, I don't <laughs> know. But, <laughs> but um, my older sister, she was just so rambunctious and, like, clumsy, honestly. She, like... <laughs> She was ice skating one day and then fell on her face and her, the whole side of her face was just off. So they were like, you need ballet. Um, and then seeing her and how she got the discipline and um, how the grace and the elegance just helped her blossom in all other parts of her life. 
and they just said, and then me and my twin came along and we're just balls of energy. <laughs> okay. Just, you guys need ballet as well. So they put us in dance and we just ran with it, honestly. So yeah, I, I think it was a, an opportunity for my mom to have a break, but <laughs> to give us discipline. It, just like I said, like ballet, the discipline and um, uh, how you, the work ethic that we get in ballet can carry over into any profession that you want to do, mm. you know, if I want to be a mathematician, I still have to sit here and like work on it and do the work, you know, that work ethic carries over into anything. So yes, it's a foundation for dance in general, but I think it's a foundation just for work and how to be a human in this society, how to be a good citizen, mm -hmm. <laughs> how to work with others. Yeah. It definitely goes into many different areas of life. Yeah. And for, for you, at, at a very young age, you lost your hearing in one of your ears. Mm -hmm. And how did that affect your growth? Or did you ever feel like it held you back as a dancer? Yeah. It, now that I um, have taken the time to actually invest in my hearing health, I have been doing so much reflection on my childhood and how it actually really did affect my growth. Um, because when I was younger, I kind of led with the blessing that I had one good ear. Mm. And so I let that be, you know, what I'm thankful for and not let my hearing get me down or like hold me back in ways. But I'm realizing now that I didn't give my hearing the space, the respect it deserves because instead of knowing that a lot of my issues, like um, insecurities, anxiety, dancer problems um instead of knowing that it is a result of my hearing i put it on myself i became a perfectionist and um just just you know beating myself down very hard on myself because i wanted to be on a level playing field um and you know i was just working so hard but this level playing field i mean it's not it's not real because i do have a disability you know, and so I, I'm beating myself up over something that I think is um, I'm not doing something I think I'm not doing because I want to be on this, le like even with you. And yeah, just not giving credit to the fact that I am deaf mm -hmm. in one ear. So yeah, basically my hearing loss really just, it gave me anxiety. Um, it turned into a perfectionism type of thing where I just want to I need to be perfect. I, I don't want anybody to know what's wrong with me. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, just in general with the hearing, um, I can't hear certain words and things in conversation. It's just like a, it falls out for me. Um, and so I, there, there comes the doubt, you know, the doubt of, am I hearing something correctly? Am I understanding something correctly? the doubt is in that conversation, but then it also turns into self-doubt and just my dancing, things like that. And then also just energetically, the flow of energy, it's just dead energy on my right side, you know? So dancing, I got a lot of injuries on my right side, you know, mm, which I, I didn't connect just because the balance is off. Hearing loss just <laughs> showed up in every area of my life and I just didn't realize it. Um, but now I'm more forgiving of myself. <laughs> it was during your time with Alvin Ailey that you got hearing aids for the first mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. what was that? What was that first day like whenever you were able to dance with, with sounds you hadn't heard before? I get chills <laughs> thinking about it. It was, it really was a groundbreaking, um, a life changing moment for me. It was, well, the piece starts with um, in a blackout and the curtain's down and we're all on stage holding each other's hands before the curtain goes up, praying, basically. And the music starts. Um, and with Ailey, because we perform Revelation so much from theater to theater, we don't necessarily tech it before um, the performance. We literally do it every night. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, so the music starts, the curtain's still down, and I'm just, I get nervous because I think that the music is faster or 
yeah, I just think the music is faster, it's louder. I'm hearing so many different layers in the music. And then on top of that, because there's just so much more um, sound, now in my, my, my hearing space, <laughs> I feel like, I, like I'm losing connection with the group in a way, it's so weird. So yeah, I, it was just like really fast and for, I think time stopped for a second because I had to get over the fact that I thought the music was just wrong, honestly. I've been listening to it for like five years now. I was like, this is not, this is not the right track. And so I had to like, okay, wait, no, you are hearing different, you're, you're hearing somebody with a, a raspy voice, you're hearing like somebody's airy soprano on top. Like a lot of things that I didn't hear, I can hear the breaths, like in between a phrase, <sighs> their inhale, their exhale, I'm like, ah, oh, I have so much more to work with. <laughs> so much more to explore so it was nervous the first time um you know with the balance and things like that but I was just like after I got over the freak out moment and I took my took a breath I was able to just now it's a playground you know mm -hmm. now I can really twirl off on the vibrato or like <laughs> suspend on the breath well, no, it sounds like a lot what us uh, actor, singer, musical theater people, what we go through when we've been rehearsing with the piano for weeks, and then we get mm -hmm. in and actually hear the full orchestra, and it's like, yeah. oh, I didn't know the violins would do that, or the flutes right. over here doing that. You hear these different things, and in some ways, the, the song sounds different. It's like, wait, this isn't the same song, because you're hearing... Right so many of those different layers. And I would mm -hmm. imagine that that's kind of what it was. You went from having a piano to a full orchestra now. Yes, that is a good explanation. Absolutely. And can you imagine just learning choreography for a piano? And now I have a full orchestra. And where I hit that zap is not, it's, it's something more than just a, a pink on the piano, you know? It's exciting. It was it was a thrill ride. And, you know, every piece after that, I was like, let me listen to this music before I go on stage. <laughs> because I don't want any surprises. Yeah. So, yeah, it was nice. Now, how has dance, since you've been with it from such a young age, how do you think that dance has influenced or impacted your life as a whole? Oh, well, yeah, since I was a young one, dance for me gave me number one outlet to... <laughs> get a lot of my energy <laughs> out, okay? Because <laughs> I'm very active. I have so, so much energy. Um, so yeah, it gave me an opportunity to, you know, get put, put my energy somewhere. Um, but it also gave me a chance to put, put all my anxieties and um, my insecurities and things. It gave me a place to, you know, take those things off and strip myself of everything that I think that I am, I think that I'm not, and just wholly be Samantha in the room. Um, but dance also is a great networking tool. I got to meet a lot of friends through college and high school and Complexion and Ailey. I have a great network of people who go in different paths, you know, and I have a lot of other talents, <laughs> so. Of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, you know, cross network with the people in the room that I'm in with right now. And, you know, they go off and do their thing and do you need help? I, oh, I will come with you. Stuff like that. Um, dance also brought travel to my life. Um, I'm able to travel and see the world and experience all these different people outside of the studio. I get to, you know, meet different people in Paris and Copenhagen and Africa and stuff. So that was nice. Um, but dance in general has given me peace. Mm. In general, I think it's given, it really has. Um, I remember one day I was just, I think I locked myself out of my apartment and I'm in New York. I locked myself out of my apartment and um, just have like family drama. And, you know, maybe like my first year in the company you know, financial, being a starving artist, like recovering from the starving artist <laughs> the lifestyle. I was just having a bad day and I, was, I didn't want to go to work, but I had to. Um, and, you know, I put my hand on the bar and then honestly, I just, 
had something to focus on, I just let it all go. It just gives me like, it, I can't say discipline enough. I just think discipline is freedom. You know what I mean? I personally love responsibility and I love taking care, care of things. And after that, I, ha I just have so much space. So I just feel like dance has given me space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. As as someone who has to work on self discipline, and yeah. it, you know, it's it's something that <laughs> that we as artists, that, yes, there are the rigors, there's the training, there are classes, there's rehearsals, but sometimes we just want to sit in front of a TV and not do anything. You know, we, mm -hmm. we certainly have those days. <laughs> But, but, but as you said, there is that, that discipline. When I get into the rehearsal room, there is that home feeling. There mm -hmm. is that sense of, okay, now I, now I can exercise these muscles that I've been lounging mm -hmm. on the couch, not using. Now I get to be up and, and use, utilize them again. Yeah. And I definitely, I feel you. I am a couch potato. <laughs> <laughs> potato. <laughs> that I am. And, um, but yeah, with dance, I can just, like you said, I, um, the space that is available to me is endless, honestly. Getting back to Alvin Ailey, it's not just the, the classic works that Alvin Ailey himself choreographed, but also new works and also bringing mm -hmm. in new choreographers. Is there just as much excitement in these new works as there is in the holding on to the legacy of Ailey? Yeah, absolutely, honestly, um, because Ailey is amazing and I love all like diving into the classics, but I also wasn't born in 1960. So right. I can experience that as much as I want. I can talk to my aunts and uncles and ask them how it was to be in the South and hot and, you know, just get all of that information from them. But I wasn't, I didn't grow up during those times, honestly. And I like Ailey because we, get to do a classic, but we get to, you know, have a fresh outlook on life or on dance and what's current, what's happening right now in the dance streets. And so we always welcome the, <laughs> the new choreographers. And it's nice to get things like to see what the dance world is doing in Europe and in um, France and all over the world, just to get all these different styles. It just adds to, you know, the pot of what we have at Ailey, you know, I can do Piazzolla Caldera by Mark Morris. That's like Argentine tango. It's like, ah, um, like a Spanish flair. You know, we get to try on all these different like hats at Ailey and it's just fun. It's a, a welcome, a welcoming experience and we get to work with new choreographers. Yeah. Now is choreographing something that you hope to transition into yourself? I do at some point. I mean, I, and I need to do it now, honestly. But um, for me, I was so heavy in choreography when I was um, studying at SUNY Purchase. And I, you know, I'm very like tunnel vision. So when I got to Ailey, I was like, let me focus on the dance. Let me focus on, you know, the Ailey aesthetic. Let me do all of that. And so now that I have it under my belt, and it was the same at Complexion that I like spent a couple of years just like, ah, in the books, like working. Mm -hmm. um, and so, now that I have my feet wet a little bit more, yeah, I want to get back into my own choreographic voice and I have nothing but time in this <laughs> quarantine right. to uh, make a couch dance and make, <laughs> make a chair dance and like get back in touch with uh, my choreographic voice. So, yeah. yeah, Definitely in the future. Does that happen a lot where as company members grow up like Judith Jameson did that they can eventually then transition to that other side yeah. of directing, choreographing? Yeah, absolutely. Ailey is thankfully such a big family and a lot of people, you know, there's no age at Ailey, so you can dance till the wheels fall off. Um, and, <laughs> right. you know, giving that much um, energy investment in the company throughout your whole life, they will take care of you after your dance career is, you know, on the other side. So, um, right. yeah, they'll, uh, if you have a passion for other things, like teaching, they'll, they can find you something within the building. Um, teaching in the school and the Ailey extension or something. Our former company member, Megan Jekyll, she works with the, um, she works in the PR department now, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, if you have an interest, they want to build you as a human, as a full functioning human being, not just a dancer. So if there's another passion in you that you can contribute to the Ailey organization, they are more than welcome to, you know, give you experience and welcome you on that side so that after Ailey, 
it's a little bit easier of a transition if you want to stay in the organization. It's really nice yeah. to have people in the offices who are dancers, who understand the stage and understand where we as former company members are coming from and how we can help the organization grow in different ways. So, yeah. Right, because then they can be advocates for you if there's a problem or concern, you know. Right, they exactly. Can, yeah, then they, they, they know what's going on. Yeah, we have um, people on the other side. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Looking out for us, definitely. <laughs> Now, I'm going to be doing something a little differently today, as well as the next episode, where I'll be speaking with another Alvin Ailey dancer, Michael McBride. Normally, I save the final five questions for a separate bonus episode on Fridays. But for this episode with Samantha and next week with Michael, I'm including the final five questions within the episode. Also, each week on Instagram, I share some unreleased audio from the episode. In editing these interviews together, there's often a clip or two that can't make it into the episode, and so I share those on Instagram. Follow the podcast at Podcast to get those unreleased audio clips each week. Thank you so much for joining me and Samantha, and without further ado, here is The Final Five. So, number one, if you could have any other job outside of the arts, outside of dancing, what would that be? I want to be a sign language interpreter. Mm, mm -hmm. That's my first one. <laughs> outside of the arts. Yeah, I want a sign language interpreter. I would be, I am good at like public relations, speaking, mm -hmm. getting people to the party. <laughs> Something in PR. <laughs> Um, now, growing up, did you need to learn sign language or were you always able to hear enough? Yeah, I was always, I have like, um, with hearing loss, uh, from my hearing loss, um, because I'm completely deaf in this ear, my left ear kind of became a super ear in some, in some respect. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I personally don't, I don't have a problem. It's only when like things are on my right side, I can't hear if I have a lot of people around a lot of background noise i can't hear over top of that so people in the studio talking key can over music lord i cannot yeah <laughs> i cannot hear things like that um so yeah it wasn't until like last year doing a lot of more research that i decided that that is something that i wanted to give back to the community because you know i also might uh my hearing loss when i'm later in my years when i'm older that's going to be something i have to figure out <laughs> right. That is a bridge that I will cross when I get there. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, number two, what is a a bucket list show, a role, something that you hope to do one day? Ooh. Right now, I want to be the lead in Tina's friend. <laughs> the <laughs> Tina. <laughs> the Tina show. I do. <laughs> Cause I can sing, I can sing. I have no nothing but time during this quarantine. So I'm at, I'm with my voice uh, coach, and we are working on things. Um, so I would love to do like on Broadway, my name and lights somewhere. But I love the Tina Turner show right now. That um, a dream role. There's a CD Lar CD Lar um, Larvae um, ballet that I would like to do. It's called The Fawn. Um, I love that ballet. I would love to do something like that. Honestly, I think I am, I, I think I have acting chops <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to be an actress. <laughs> I can certainly, I can certainly tell you that, yes, you love, <laughs> to, you are drama incarnate. Drama. Hi. Yes. <laughs> Hi, drama. Help me. <laughs> so for me to channel that energy. Yes. I would yes. like to be like a musical theater type of I think that's what I'm like working towards after my early career. Yeah, because that because that's something your older sister did, and so right. mm -hmm. yeah, and so she kind of taught you, hey, this is a path for you as well. Yeah, and I love my older sister because <laughs> she she hooked me up with um Desmond Richardson and told him to keep an eye out on me. So thanks, Dion. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, speaking of which, number three, who is it that you look up to either as a, either as a mentor or someone that inspires you? Yes, I really look up to my up to my older sister, Dion Figgins. She inspires me so much. I wouldn't be here, honestly, if it wasn't for her 
hard work and determination throughout her career. So I try to, again, mimic that so that I can inspire other people coming up behind me. But outside of my family, honestly, my other good friend, Akua, really inspires me. She's in the company. She danced at Dance at Harlem with my sister. And she's just really dedicated. She's just been really de dedicated to the art form and um, how she's transitioned throughout her career and from ballet to going to dance here in San Jose Ballet to going to dance here at um, Ailey and just how she's taken care of her body, how she's made changes in her life to um, be a, you know, a better dancer, a better person. Um, you know, it's a full transformation is not what you do in the studio, not what you do on stage, but it's, you know, what you do at home and stuff. So I really respect her. Yeah, it's really, it's really great when we can find those people that we work mm -hmm. with, especially in a company like yours, that where with people coming and going to have those people to kind of latch on to, to be like, okay, there's the, not, not so much someone to imitate, but, but that's an example of the kind of person that we all can yeah, be. Yeah, you know? absolutely. She's definitely, she's definitely been that for me. And because she's close with my sister coming into Ailey, she kind of like <laughs> grabs me and was like, take me care. I was like, thank you. <laughs> it was scary here. <laughs> and so, yeah, but yeah, just watching her journey in the company and I just really appreciate her. All right, number four, name a lesson or trait that took you a while to learn or one that you're still working on today. The one that I'm still working on today and I think that's a lot of my hearing loss is only, I think taking your struggles and turning them into your strengths or turning them into something that you can work with. You know, I, like my hearing loss, I didn't give it, you know, the credit deserved, but doing the research and things like that, it has made me a, a more whole person, I think, and has given me a lot of other opportunities. Like, if I didn't really recognize my hearing loss, I wouldn't know that I have a whole route, a career path, honestly, for me to pour myself into. I would say turning your struggles, your insecurities and things into your triumph. Yeah, especially now because we're, we're all suffering through this the same. This is crazy. Yeah, so we have to turn it into something useful. Yeah. What is it? Take your lemons and make lemonade. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, we didn't just get lemons. We got rotten lemons out of right. this, and we're trying to do Ooh, something. Turn it into fertilizer. <laughs> right? Make some compost. There you go. Well, speaking of which, speaking of which, what, what is... What? <laughs> the last question, number five, is what is the best advice that you've received? Oh, I have so much advice. Um, the best advice I have received personally is <laughs> to... Invest all your energy in making your plan A work. And this is great advice for people coming out of college. Um, if you, I have this plan, this dream to be a dancer. And, you know, life comes at you. I'm fresh out of college. I need finances. I need money. I need to network. I need, I need to survive. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I think I really put my faith in making it work, making sure I go to the dance classes, the um, workshops for companies that I wanted to be in, like um, whatever it is that you want to make yourself into, you have to put your energy into that. And so I did that the majority of my first year out of college until my money ran out. <laughs> and so I had to get another job and that I had to get a waitressing job. And that was from like five to I wasn't getting home till like three in the morning to go back to my full dance classes throughout the day, like 10 to 10 to 4 30 mm. dance classes. And that's where I really realized, you know, the lesson that I told myself about the plan A, um, <clears throat> because I got into the dance classes and I was exhausted. I couldn't give all my energy into the dance classes and the networking. And so I'm not showing up at my 100% you know, for something that I love, that I want to make my dream, you know, and with that also, the way you put your intention into the universe, say exactly what you mean and what you want and be very clear about that because the universe is listening. 
Oh, no, I like that. I like that. I like that a lot. It works for me. I think that could work for a lot of us, actually. If that don't work, be yourself. <laughs> <laughs>